Hello. The title of my talk tonight is In Praise of Vulnerable Travel. Now, that might sound like a strange idea, but it is. It's this idea that changed my life and how I've come to see the world. Now, that <laughs> is the face of somebody with a boring office job. <laughs> but it's also the face of somebody who has recently passed their motorcycle test. And that is one hell of an explosive combination. And the explosion in this case involved me leaving that job and going to ride a little dirt bike from there, Alaska, 20,000 miles to there, Tierra del Fuego, Ushuaia, the southernmost town in the world at the tip of Argentina. Now, I have to say, I'd never done anything like this in my life. Hadn't even ridden my bike outside of London, really. I'm not really a biker. I'd hardly even travelled outside of Western Europe, so I didn't know anyone that had done anything like this. So when I started telling people, telling friends and family, I was hit with this deluge of horror stories and warnings, all well-meaning, but all these awful things that were going to happen to me on the road out there. So my reaction to this was to panic and to fill my bags and my bike and my pockets and everything with just loads of stuff that would keep me safe. So I got a, a rape alarm and I bought those, you know, those weird dried food packets that you'd never eat in a million years and loads of medicines for all of the uh, most obscure tropical diseases that I was obviously going to get and gadgets and just all this stuff that was, was going to make it all safe. And then I got another rape alarm just in case that one broke. And then I thought, well, I better buy two of everything just in case, except for these. <laughs> I took loads of those. And so I was ready to go, ready to take on the world now. So I set off, quaking, terrified, with my knife in my inside pocket and dollar bills stuffed in my bra and ready for anything. And it was only got worse when I got to America and everyone was horrified that I was going south of the border. Bandits, you'll get robbed by bandits, raped by bandits, bandits, places teeming with bandits down in Mexico. So I approached the border and crossed nervously seeking out these bandits, ready with all my alarms and weapons and things. And, oh, there they are. They're only little after all. <laughs> so the next day, there were still no bandits or rapists or robbers, and the next day. And what they turned out to be were people. They seemed to be people like you and me, just going to work and taking their kids to school and going about their business, chatting and drinking and talking. And hmm. So, as I continue south, two things happened. One, I started talking to these people, and they were very friendly and helpful, and yeah, they were curious about me, but I was curious about them, and we kind of, you know, checked each other out. <laughs> and the second thing that happened, all of that stuff, it started getting on my nerves, all of that clobber weighing me down. And I realised I'd brought it with me just in case. So just in case, that had been my modus operandi. But it was like having an insurance salesman travelling with me in my head. What about this? What if that happens? What if that happens? <sighs> so I realised that this excess baggage was my emotional baggage. It was my fears travelling with me. And when I got rid of it all, I, I was free, completely free, for the first time ever in my life. Remember them? <laughs> well, this is what happened to them. <laughs> yeah, turns out you only need three pairs. Turn them inside out, they last for six days. <laughs> so, as I continued on through South America and I went home and sort of the whole thing sort of sunk in, I started thinking about the next trip, obviously. I realised that the reason for me for, to travel is, are the human connections that are made. But to make these connections meaningful and real, you have to lay yourself bare. You can't insulate yourself and, and hide away. You have to be vulnerable. But this very word, vulnerable, vulnerability, it has negative connotations and certainly is never used in a positive way when referring to a woman travelling alone. 
and I I understand that it, it, it's it's difficult to to just lay yourself out there and just say hey you know I'm here that's not my natural state either I, I like to organize things and make stuff happen I like to take care of stuff you know this is the inner me you know I can do it so that that's how I felt I wanted to get out there do all this stuff but I had to get over this 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 these fears and this this kind of um, insulation and it was in a way you have to be like that when you when you're alone traveling the world you especially on a motorbike you do have to know how to fix a puncture or change your, your clutch plates or whatever it is work on your bike and do with whatever the road throws at you which in this case could be some giant rocks <laughs> um, but so there's a much harder lesson once you get out on the road and that is to understand that you can't control everything all of the time. And that's the most difficult lesson of all, especially if you are the kind of person that likes to get on with stuff and take care of business. But what you find is that when you do get out there and you, and you do meet these other people and they do see you out there in their country, their instinct isn't, to, when they see you alone, their instinct isn't to say, oh, I'll go and rip her off and rob her. The natural human instinct, and I'm sure you'll all agree, you'll all feel the same, is you see somebody and you think, oh, I hope they're okay. Do they need any help? And I know this because it's happened to me all over the world. So suddenly your vulnerability becomes a positive asset and you bring out the best in people. So after I got rid of all of that stuff on that first trip, I began to realize that all of this clobber that we think we need, all this uh, gear that we think we need for an adventure actually gets in the way of having this, the real raw experience. It's, it's almost like a GPS, for example. It sounds like a brilliant piece of kit because you'll never get lost again. But it actually means that you will never ask for directions. So you'll never strike up that conversation. You'll never uh, get invited back to somebody's house because of that conversation or to meet their family or to the wild party. And that is the essence of the adventure. So there's this huge industry in fear and fear will sell you all of this insurance policies and gadgets and, 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 and equipment that are essentially barriers to those human connections that are so important. Something like a tracking device, which you can have now, wherever you go in the world, if you're going out into some remote desert or something. Again, it makes you feel safe, but it means you never fully engage with your experience and your surroundings, your environment, because you know that someone back home is tracking you or can find you, and if something goes wrong, they can come and get you. So you have a completely different mindset about your adventure. And even just a laptop or your smartphone cuts you off from your immediate surroundings too. And I speak as someone who's completely addicted to their phone and totally knows the joy of finding that Wi-Fi signal. So it's hard for me, you know, I, I have difficulty letting go. But when you do let go of all of these um, gadgets, you are more vulnerable and suddenly you find you have to rely on these other people in these strange countries where nothing works right and they don't speak your language. But of course, that's the beauty of it. And nowhere is this more true for me than when I went to Iran. Now, I went to Iran because it sounded like a scary thing to do. Now, I don't mean that in a I'm really brave way, because I'm not. I was scared. But when I examined my fear and I analysed it, I realised it, it wasn't really fear. It was just ignorance by another name. Because we all know about Iran, right? Crazy, raging Islamists setting fire to our embassies, burning our flags. We've seen it on the telly, so it must be true. Those crazy terrorists, they've got nuclear weapons, they hate the West. So I thought, what the hell are they going to make of me? Some British bird from London turning up on a motorbike, of all things. <laughs> Red hair, three pairs of knickers, fondness for gin and tonic. How's that going to go down in the Islamic Republic of Iran? So as usual, I approached the border, quaking in my boots. And sure enough, I came face to face with the terrifying Iranians. <laughs> there we are, sorry. <laughs> now, I, l I love this picture. It's probably my favourite picture of the whole trip. Just 
linger on those smiles because they are so genuine. I fear the moustache is probably genuine too. But <laughs> this sums up my whole experience in Iran. I have never known in any country such a, 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 a rush, like a tidal wave of warmth and hospitality and openness and, and just the, the human connection as I did with the Iranian people. I couldn't go a mile without somebody stopping to give me tea, feed me. I put on five pounds in a month. Uh, it was just incredible. There was one point I was a bit scared when a truck driver tried to run me off the road. He jumped out of his cab, came running towards me. I thought, here we are, here's the scary Islamists they've told me about. But he just wanted to give me a bag of pomegranates. <laughs> so Iran, for me, sums up exactly what the concept of vulnerable travel is all about. I did feel vulnerable in that country for all the obvious reasons, but there was really no need. But I wouldn't have been able to do that trip, I don't think, without my first uh, experience through Africa, where I really learned the power of vulnerable travel. Now, I went to Africa because, for me, it represented the, the most exciting possible adventure that you could have on a motorcycle. And I wanted to go totally lo-fi, so no electronic gadgets. I didn't have any laptop or phone or anything. But I still, it was hard to relinquish that control. I still was writing lists and organising things. I had a big padlock and I was kind of paranoid and nervous about it all. And it wasn't until I got to Angola, which is kind of like right down here actually, so quite a way, by which time... I'd already ridden across the Sahara Desert and through the Congo, and I'd been covered in mud for weeks on end and been through some of the most exhilarating and, and, and scary and, and exciting experiences of my life. But it wasn't until I reached Angola that I gave up on it all. Now, I don't mean I gave up and went home and thought, sod this, I've had enough. I mean, I gave up trying to be in control. I gave up trying to be safe and secure and make everything happen just how I wanted it. I gave up trying to wash and wear clean underwear. And it was brilliant. I was all smelly and dirty and I loved it and I was totally liberated. And with that liberation came a, an opening up of the heart. And it was then in Angola, in this country that's been wrecked by a long civil war, had only just come out of the war, that I found myself surrounded by these wonderful, warm, kind people everywhere I went. Again, it was when I was at my most vulnerable that the most rewarding experiences occurred. And you can't really get more vulnerable than being on your own in a raging storm in the middle of Angola, completely lost, and then realise that you've actually strayed into a minefield, which is exactly what happened to me. I, I got to a track junction... And I wasn't, sure, I wasn't sure which way to go. This crazy storm was raging, thunder and lightning and rain pouring everywhere. And so I followed this route that looked quite promising into the woods. It was kind of broken up road. But all roads in Angola are pretty broken up. So, but it had these concrete posts along it and they looked quite official and like it was a route. So I went down there and then the weirdest thing happened. After about half a mile, I had this premonition. I mean, something really bigger than me said, Lois, you've taken the wrong route felt it really, really powerfully. So I decided to do a U-turn and go back and think again and get the map out and the compass. And as I did this, I swung around these trees and I, I did this big loop to turn around and my eyes caught one of these concrete posts and even with all the rain and the storm, I could see that there was some faded writing on it. So I peered a bit closer and to my horror, I saw that the writing was accompanied with, uh, by a skull and crossbones. Now, that's never a good sign. <laughs> so, my heart beating a little bit faster, I pointed my headlight onto the post, and this was the sight that greeted me. Now, if you can't read it from where you are, it says, Danger, Mines. And I had this horrible realisation. These posts weren't saying, Hey, come this way, this is the road. They were saying, Don't come this way, this is the minefield. But by which point, it was too late. I was already in the middle of it. So I sat there on my bike, frozen in terror. Crazy thunder above me and flashing lightning. The rain had washed away my tracks. And I had this thought, well, the first thought was, nobody in the whole world knows I'm here. Nobody knows where I am. And there will be nobody coming down here for a very, very long time. 
And then I had to weigh up my choices. So I thought, well, either I just sit here on my bike, getting wet, and I eat the last of my emergency chocolate biscuits. And then eventually I just die. And the other choice is, I just make a run for it and hope that I don't get my legs blown off. So really, I didn't have a choice at all. If I wanted to live, I just had one thing to do. Now, I don't remember much of that ride back. I think it involved me screaming with my eyes closed and going really, really fast. But by the time I got back to the junction, I was a quivering wreck of, of hysteria and adrenaline and just all, all over the place. And it was then that I heard this little p p part of an engine. And I turned around, sure enough, there's a little motorbike, a guy sitting on it, and he's looking at me. And I was very surprised. I hadn't seen a single human being or vehicle all day. It was a very remote plateau in Angola. And I was so happy to see him. I threw myself upon him, practically, to help me, help me, I'm lost. And I went to a minefield. Uh. And he was just sitting like this, all cool. And he was immaculately dressed. I remember I looked like a tramp, completely covered in mud. Now, he's wearing shiny white shoes and fake Gucci sunglasses, even though it's nearly dark. <laughs> and he's looking at me like, slightly amused, grinning, trying not to laugh. And I'm like screaming. And he said, where are you from? And I said, England, London, England. And he just went, he raised his eyebrows and he went, oh, yeah, yeah, why did the Cape Town? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we looked at each other and he laughed and I just felt that big. Because what he was saying in his sweet way really was, you come here for fun, for an adventure. But this is our normal life. This is my daily commute to and from work. But somehow this kid who was, you know, probably 19, 20, He'd known nothing but a war zone his entire life, managed to find some humour in this situation, but also some empathy for me in my ridiculous, self-inflicted predicament. And he patted me on the shoulder, he said, come on, I'll show you the way. And he plunged into this river and over all these rocks, and I was going along trying to keep up with him. And eventually, he deposited me on safe, dry ground. And the storm had lifted, and there was this incredible, bright pink sunset ahead of us. And he pointed me in the right direction with a little wave literally rode off into the sunset. And that was the moment that I dropped the biggest, heaviest impediment of all, my ego. And that was the best thing I ever got rid of. Because when you're, you start out doing these trips, you're young and you, you, you think, yeah, this is cool, I'm riding a motorbike around the world. And you take pictures of yourself like posing with your bike, with your leather jacket or sunglasses on, and you're like gnarly and tough places. And you think, yeah, this is it, it's all about me. But after that incident with that guy in Angola, I realised this wasn't about me taking on the world. It was about me being in the world, our world. So I'll always be grateful to my cool Angolan dude. I didn't even know his name. And I'll be grateful to my Iranian truck driver and his pomegranates and so many other people who show me that there really is no need to be fearful out there. There's no need to be fearful because we're different to each other. And this is applicable whether you're riding a motorbike in the Congo or Iran or whatever, or just walking down your own street. This isn't about world travel, really. It's not about motorbikes. <laughs> so, yeah, we talk different. We, we look different. We probably have completely different opinions on all sorts of things. But it doesn't really matter. If there's one thing that, a conclusion that I've reached, meeting all these different people in these different cultures, it's that we basically have the same needs in life, the same wants, the same desires. We need food and shelter. We need love, of course. And of course, we all desire that source of true happiness. Free Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope that you will see and you will agree that being vulnerable creates connections. And those connections, however small, can make a huge difference. So suddenly, being vulnerable isn't a weakness. It's this incredible, powerful force. Thank you. Efa Risto.